Hi everyone, welcome back to Operations Research. So starting from today, we're going to use two weeks to discuss the idea about the simplex method, which will be the main algorithm that we introduce to solve linear programs. So, <coughs> as we mentioned, this will be the topic of to solve linear programs. This algorithm was developed by George Danzig in 1974. And actually, this is the first, uh, in some sense, the first successful algorithm in the field of operations research. And of, of course, that also thanks to uh, the development of modern computers. Only without, uh, if we do not have those computers, then, as you will see, it's impossible to calculate all those calculations. Okay, so, as we, uh, in this case, we say that um, we use this simplex method in a lot of commercial LP solvers, for example, for those solvers that we will teach you in this course. Roughly speaking, they use uh, the simplex method as the main body. As you will see, this algorithm is very efficient for almost all practical linear programs, and the idea is somewhat simple. Okay? Uh, here, simple does not mean that you can learn this algorithm in 10 minutes. Okay, we still need two weeks to completely give you the idea. But um, the intuition is simple. Okay, it's just that we need some uh, basic knowledge about linear algebra. We need some, um, some study about that. But I hope that at the end of these two lectures, you will uh, feel, you will agree that this algorithm has a very simple idea. Okay, and the method is general. That means it can solve any linear program, but only in an indirect manner. That means we know that LP may be of many different forms. There may be greater than or equal to or less than or equal to or equality constraints. There may be non-negative, non-positive, or free variables. We show that each LP is equivalent to a standard form LP. A standard form means an LP in a certain format. And then we can show that how may we solve standard form LPs. Okay? This strategy is quite a good one because you do not need to develop multiple methods to accommodate multiple forms of a problem. Okay? All you need to do is to develop one method for one type of the input and then you show that this input, this format of input can actually formulate all kinds of different problems, okay? That's the strategy of the simplex method. So, uh, for today's lecture, I hope that you will study uh, section 4.1 to 4.4 of the textbook uh, in details and that will Enhance your, um, enhance your understanding a lot. These two lectures will be full of algebra and the theorems, so somehow uh, mathematically it's somewhat harder than the previous two lectures. But anyway, uh, we will do that as slow as possible, so that I hope everyone can get the idea. Okay, so in this video I will tell you what is a, lin a standard form linear program and some properties. So, what is a standard form? An LP is in the standard form if the following three things happen. Uh, let's talk about the second, the second thing. All the variables must be non-negative. The third one is the, all the constraints are equalities. And the first one says the right-hand side values are non-negative. So, right-hand side values are um, constraint right-hand side. Okay? For any constraint, we separate that term without the decision variable and put that to the right-hand side of the um, operator. Okay? And then for these constraints, this constant B is the right-hand side. So collectively, there are these three conditions for a standard form. One thing to mention is that there is no restriction on the objective function, okay? We talk about constraints right-hand side. We talk about the like, constraint format, and we talk about variables, but there is nothing to do with the objective function. 
you may have either maximization or minimization linear programs in your standard form. So, the first thing is to show that given any linear program, we may find its standard form. So let's do this. We know requirement 1 is to have non-negative right-hand side. So this part is easy. If the right-hand side is negative, all we need to do is to switch the left-hand side and right-hand side, right? For example, if for this inequality, the right-hand side is negative 4, all you need to do is to change it to a greater than or equal to constraint and make the right-hand side positive. Requirement 2 is about non-negative variables, so this will um, be a little bit harder. First, a variable may be non-negative, non-positive, and free, right? If it is non-positive, then we need to replace it by negative xi. So for example, if we have a constraint here and x1 is non-positive, then we replace x1 by, main, uh, by negative x1. Okay, so this new x1 will become non-negative. And also, you need to change the sign of the coefficient of x1 in every constraint in the objective function because x1 is actually negative x1 now. Okay, so that's why you have a negative 2 here. If xi is a free variable, which means it can be positive or negative or zero, in this case, we need to replace it by a difference of two non-negative variables. Let's call them xi prime and xi prime prime. Both of them should be non-negative. So uh, without proving this uh, in a detail, let me just give you one example. Suppose I have this constraint with an unrestricted inside variable. What I should do is to replace this variable by x1 prime minus x1 prime prime, right? So this constraint becomes this one, with two non-negative variables. No matter what's the value of xi in the original formulation, it can be expressed by the difference in the new formulation. If xi is positive, then xi prime will be positive and xi prime prime can just be zero. Or if xi is negative, then xi prime can be zero and xi prime prime to be the to measure the magnitude of xi. Okay? So looking at this example you may realize that no matter what's the value of xi, your xi prime minus xi prime prime can always handle xi, can always express the value of xi. That's how we change a free variable into two non-negative variables. The last requirement is to have all equality constraints. So if we have a less than or equal to constraint, we need to somehow fill the gap, right? So we add a slick variable at the left hand side. For example, if I have this inequality constraint, I know the right hand side may be greater than the left hand side. So in any case, I am adding a slick variable x3. So if in the original case, the left hand side and the right hand side are actually equal, then x3 can just be 0. But if the left hand side is less than 4, then x3 just need to be the number, the gap, the, the, the value of that gap. Okay? So in by doing so, we can form an equality constraint with one additional variable to express the original inequality constraint. For greater than or equal to constraint, we do a very similar thing. We minus or subtract a surplus or ex excess variable okay, from the left hand side. So if this is the original greater than or equal to constraint, we minus a, slick va a surplus variable at the left hand side. And this certainly also needs to be non-negative. Okay? We do a plus here, we do a minus here because we need the slake or surplus variable to be non-negative. So to make our expressions easier, in the future we will also we will call all of them slick variables. We will not distinguish whether this thing comes from a 
in equal uh, less than or equal to inequality or a greater than or equal to inequality. Okay, all of them will be called slick variables. And the only intuition that you need to have is that a slick variable measures the gap between the original left hand side and right hand side. Given any solution, given any pair of x1 and x2, you plug in, you get a number at the left hand side, right? And the slick variable measures what's the difference between the left hand side and right hand side. So as an example, suppose I have a program like this, three variables, three constraints, uh, I mean functional constraints. Then I need to do several things to get the standard form. The first thing I observe is that there is a negative right hand side. So all I need to do is to fix the second constraint and change everything to a negation. So x1 becomes negative x1, x2 becomes x2. Greater than or equal to becomes less than or equal to, and the negative 8 becomes 8. And then, the second thing I observe is that I need to follow requirement 2, which means all my variables should be non-negative. So I need to do something to x2 and x3. So because previously x2 is non-positive, so I switch, I change x2 to negative x2. And that makes me all those negative coefficients for x2. For x3, I replace this to x3 minus x4. Okay, and I need to do that modification for all the variables, for all the constraints and the objective function. So, by making this adjustment, now all the variables are non-negative. <coughs> the last thing I do is certainly to fix these inequality constraints. For the first one, because it is a greater than or equal to uh, constraint, so I minus a slick variable. For the second one, because it is a less than or equal to constraint, so I plus a, uh, a slick variable. Okay. So after all of this, I have a standard form linear program. Three equality constraints, six variables non-negative variables. And one thing to remind you is that I don't need to do any modification to the objective function, um, to the direction of the objective function. Okay? So now we know, given any linear program, we may find its standard forms. That's very good. We will also need to introduce to you the, the matrix format of a standard form because that will be required for us to develop some theory in the future. So in general, a standard form linear program can be compactly expressed with matrices like this. I want to minimize something, C transpose X. Here C is a vector, right? C somehow just expressed those uh, coefficient, val uh, coefficient in the objective function. Subject to the constraints are just ax equals b, because we have several linear equality constraints, right? They can just be expressed as a linear system, ax equals b. And finally, all variables must be non-negative, so it's just a vector inequality. x should be non-negative. As an example, suppose I have a standard form problem like this. Okay, two, uh, two, cons two functional constraints, four variables, one minimization um, objective functions. And then what I should do is to find the A, B, and C as my parameters. Okay, in the matrix representation, there are three parameters, A, B, and C. And in this case, A is the coefficient matrix. Okay. So it's 1, 5, 1, 0, 3, negative 6, 0, 1, which is just copy everything into this matrix. For B, is the right-hand side vector, so it's just it's 5, 4. For C, C collects the objective coefficients in a column vector, so it's 2, negative 1, 0, 0. Okay, so just a simple example. A is the coefficient matrix, B is the right-hand side vector, and C is the objective vector, 
Okay, so these are the names of these parameters, and we may uh, refer to this a lot for a lot of times in this course. Finally, the objective function can be either max or min. So keep in mind. Okay, so we're done about standard forms. Now we only need to find a way to solve standard form problems, right? Because when I give you any linear program, you first convert it to the standard form. If you can find an optimal solution for the standard form, you certainly know how to get back to your original, obje, ob, original optimal solution, right? Because there you just need to do some tiny transformations on the values of your variables so that you can get the original optimal solution. So that's not a very big deal. But now the question is, how may we solve the standard form linear programs? And that's what we need to do for all the remaining uh, videos for this week. A key observation from the previous lecture is that a standard form linear program is still a linear program. So if there is an optimal solution, there must be an extreme point optimal solution. Okay, This will be exactly the thing that we rely on to solve standard form linear programs. So we want to search among extreme points. And it turns out that the extreme points of standard form linear programs are very special. And exactly that's why we want to define LP in a standard form. So our next step will be to understand more about the extreme points of a standard form so that when we want to search among extreme points, it will be an easy task. Okay, thank you.